Hi everyone, welcome back to Money and Me, the podcast by the Coin Republic. And uh, in the Money and Me, we get super and super interesting guests to our uh, podcast platform where they talk about all things crypto, Web3 and blockchain. And uh, today we have a really interesting guest who is going to talk a lot about the tech side of things and how Web3 functions and also about Vanza Innovations. We have Vanza Innovations CTO Ali Safri with us. Hi Ali, it's my pleasure hi, to have you. Hi, hi everyone. Ali, it's lovely to have you on our show today. And uh, my first question usually to all my guests is how their journey has been in the space. Of course, the space itself isn't as old. I mean, we'd like to say a decade, but we know that the real uh, growth has happened over the li- last five to six years. But your journey in the space has been quite extensive. You've been around for quite some time. Um, how have you evolved? How has your journey been? And uh, if you can talk a little bit about your role at Avanza as the CTO. Okay, so uh, I joined uh, Avanza Innovation in the uh, as in the position of the CTO. So it is like six to seven years uh, back when I assumed this role. And uh, the task that I had was uh, to do things around the emerging stack of technologies, which is, includes the blockchain, the AI, the metaverse, the Web3. So around this, how to capitalize the market, how to create new products, now how to create new value chain. Uh, and how I landed into the CTO is my desire about learning uh, futuristic things from the very beginning. So when I was in kind of a school at that point in time, those 8086 kind of processes used to come, uh, very thick kind of monitors used to come. I, I learned the programming languages at that point in time. Then I did my graduation in computer science. And at that time in my first semester or something, I was reading books like Applied Cryptography, so which is like the foundation of the modern blockchain. So what are public uh, PKI algorithms and everything. And I used to things uh, read things like a VRML. That's a very old language, which is was used for VR or a 3D programming at that point in time. There was no concept of the VR gears at that point in time. But I believe that there is an evolution in the technology space that's going to happen. So it's a general passion to be in that particular technology space. So once I graduated, I did master's in kind of a distributed computing and distributed database. So once again, uh, kind of getting closer to a futuristic technology, which would be a DLT or a blockchain. So I started as my career as a programmer, then I became a kind of a team lead, then I became a architect and a kind of an enterprise architect. But after that, I I thought about that technology projects, uh, a technology could be kind of successful, but that doesn't mean a project is successful because organizations may not embrace it and there would be thousand others non-technical reason why it would fail. So I purposely switched to understand this more. So I switched to a role of a technical project manager. So I was seeing the technology, but the people side of things, the project side of things. And then I thought about once I was quite much good at it and many failed projects I transformed into successful ones. Uh, So then I thought how the selling side of things happen. So I went into the pre-sales or the technical sales. Then I had all these particular ideas in my organization. There was an innovation program, so I became a chief innovation officer there. So we incubated many projects and uh, certain new technologies. And then uh, one of the things was to work around the blockchain, which I suggested to the company that this is an upcoming technology and we should invest some time. So that's where the Avanza Innovation was created across, and I became the CTO of that particular company. So this is the overall story how we uh, get into the Avanza innovations. And this is where we create um, a new kind of product uh, with a kind of a value chain along with it. And until now, successfully, we have implemented blockchain, Web3, Metaverse, uh, Creative AI, and some work done in the past. Lovely. That sounds pretty illustrious. And I have to say that you did 
mentioned that you started off as a programmer, then on to a team lead, and currently you're, of course, the CTO. So you've had your fair share of experiences in different roles in different sectors. Yeah. And um, I think now is a great time for me to also mention that you've explored various sectors, including, but of course, not limited to government transformation, financial regulation, supply chain. Um, and you yourself mentioned AI, um, RWAs, metaverse. Um, these as sectoral challenges itself is something that you have explored at length. So um, in your various challenges and experiences, um, what were some of the most outstanding experiences as well as I feel uh, the most challenging uh, situations that you faced? And uh, of course, you're free to talk about all of them, but uh, I would also uh, love to understand whether your involvement with the metaverse sector has in any way been a sort of challenge because simply how the metaverse sector has progressed. Uh, yes. So what I'll talk about is that the three areas that we work across for digital transformation uh, is uh, around the blockchain and use of the AI technology. So here we have uh, like transformed the ecosystems. Uh, so for in the digital government transformation, for example, so the, when the Dubai government came across with this blockchain agenda to implement the blockchain across the board. So one of the use cases that we initially did with them is around the financial reconciliation of the uh, UAE government entities and their uh, payment uh, related data. So all this settlement that was done using the blockchain because it provides an advantage of an inst instantaneous settlement. With the Bipolis immigration authorities, courts, and prosecution, there was a use case that is done um, like four years back and it's still uh, operational. It is around the lost passport. So what happens is that when a passport is lost across, you cannot just simply go to the embassy in UAE and say, give me a new passport. You require the NOC from the police and the other authorities because it might be that your passport might be confiscated as well. So the process was very, very much cumbersome. And it was like Dubai government's uh, uh, like uh, understanding of a futuristic situation because they were hosting the expo over here and they thought many people will lose the passport. And if the process would be quite much difficult, that would create to uh, dissatisfaction of the upcoming uh, tourists within the country, right? So they launched a blockchain platform with the, which we provide the technology for. So. NOCs are updated on that particular chain and you get a lost passport certificate almost immediately because if everybody is providing the uh, NOCs on the chain, um, that's a faster situation. So similar uh, very uh, government transformation projects we have done where we have used the blockchain and the AI technology. Second area is around the financial regulation and supervision. So two most important uh, prominent areas that we uh, worked on is that within the UAE, there is a uh, UAE Trade Connect Network, uh, which is now rebranded as Hyphen. So over there, there are 16 plus financial institution. And there is a very uh, 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 specific problem which cannot be solved without the blockchain technology. The problem is that if a corporate wants to get invoice-based finances, this means that if there is an upcoming invoice that I'm going to get, so I will be paid my, by my uh, 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 counterparty. Uh, so for that, uh, there is a promise that there is a payment. I'll go to the bank and I'll tell them, okay, finance based on this particular invoice. But nobody stops me to go to another bank and get the financing. This is called a duplicate financing scenario. Why banks would not otherwise talk to each other? Because maybe this is a genuine financing and the bank might steal the other bank customer. So over a blockchain network, without revealing the information of the invoice, the banks can see that it's a duplicate finance or not. And along with the, all the data that is being available, a lot of AI based checks are happening for the fraud on this particular network. So it's a big success within uh, UAE um, that is uh, still working in terms of the straight financing umbrella. Secondly, another bank guarantee network is being launched whereby the banks would issue a digital version of the bank guarantee, which could be verified uh, by the beneficiaries and other parties, because this is a big challenge even now, faking or counterfeiting of uh, bank guarantees, because somebody is giving in a bank guarantee and the beneficiary, when they want to exercise their rights based on the bank guarantee, it may be found out that the amount is wrong on the bank guarantee, or maybe it's a total fake bank guarantee. So to avoid such frauds, 
this network takes care of. Now, KYC information sharing is another big area that we have worked in. So in countries like Bahrain, we have rolled out uh, KYC uh, over the blockchain. In Pakistan as well, more than 40 banks are being using uh, this KYC network that we are deploying over there in a totally distributed uh, technology manner. Uh, so that's another area of the financial uh, space that we are working on. We are working with certain insurance chain as well, where insurance companies could do the settlement of their claims for the vehicles. So this is another area that we have worked on. So this is the major area which is happening in the financial supervision and control. The third thing is the supply chain area. So we are working with a chain with Dubai Customs, which is like spearheaded by Dubai Customs which includes a lot of e-commerce companies, the logistic companies, the courier companies, the free zone. And the idea over there is that based on the e-commerce industry, there are a lot of statistics that more than 30 to 40 percent items are returned back. So if you want to do a cross-border e-commerce, the problem is a person sitting in Saudi might uh, get something from a web website from UAE. So that item is shipped to Saudi, but when he returns back that particular product, the custom authority will say, we don't know about this. Maybe it's an import. So you need to pay the import duties. So that's a very complicated process. But if you stamp all the tracing of this particular e-commerce transaction from the time it was ordered on a com company's website to the logistic companies that handled it, uh, to the free zones that handled it, uh, to the courier or last mile delivery uh, services that provided that particular uh, package to that particular consumer when when they return this particular order. If every traceability information is on the blockchain, then those kind of problems don't arise. Similarly, we work with uh, organization like Aramco to optimize their invoice verification process projects over blockchain. We are working with K companies in Kuwait to optimize across the shipping uh, uh, related uh, information a process called shipment nomination in case of uh, um, oil uh, container deliveries. So that are the areas that we are uh, optimizing using the blockchain technology. So these were some of the areas that I am working on, uh, that we as Avanza are working on and optimizing. Wow, lovely. I must say that Avanza has had a very multi-sectoral approach in terms yes. of solving problems and uh, just a few a few hours back in fact i was uh, talking to this gentleman and we spoke about how um blockchain at its core um uh, the importance of blockchain at its core uh, does signify um how easily processes um, are sort of made like uh, a lot of solutions that you are providing are for problems that always existed but couldn't have been solved as easily as they are being able to with the use of blockchain tech and of course at Avanza you guys have been actively doing that and have had a very multi-sectoral approach working with so many governments at the core of Avanza what is the vision and mission um, that you guys have and I see that a lot of impact generated projects have been a part of your portfolio in terms of just the kind of work that you guys have managed to put out there so um, what is the core vision that um, sort of drives Avanza? Okay, so the core vision is that we are passionate about how technology can transform business operations. So that's where we want to invest into innovative technologies, research about them, productize those particular pain points, and then go to the market and try to solve problems for our customers. So that's the gist of the overall company. So that's why we have been going into these technologies. And if there would be any future technologies, we would actually try to grab them and uh, try to be early on so that we could capitalize when they be become mainstreams. Right, absolutely. So you've uh, obviously been involved with a lot of pioneering Web3 projects, uh, including NFT marketplaces. And you've also worked with a lot of RWA tokenization uh, platforms. Um, a lot of those things sailed well, and a lot of those things did not sail well if uh, we talk about marketplaces and back when they started, the kind of hype that was there around marketplaces versus now when a lot of um, a lot of different people are sort of doing the same thing or different different projects are doing the same thing. Um, 
and if you take a look at RWAs um, and how that is working, it's still in it's a work in progress. But there are a lot of expectations from the sector at large, or even if we talk about deep in uh, projects, there's a lot of expectation uh, from such technologies. How do you see such technologies sort of shaping um, interactions and operations, like you mentioned? Okay, so. Uh, there is a technology and there is always a hype around technology as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So Gartner classifies as a, 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 a hype cycle. So you have some hype and but there is a plateau of productivity that ultimately comes in, in, in the end. So one other thing along with rolling out a technology is to understand the mechanics of or the economies of those particular technologies. There are things like, for example, NFTs, there was a craze, but again, at the very bottom, the economics were not clear to us even in, in the beginning. So one of the thing was that, okay, this might not work. This is a kind of a hype, but when people will actually realize, is there any real value? So they will realize that there is no real value because NFT was uh, like, uh, moving around this particular discipline that I have a digital copy of a product, but it is very easy for anybody to copy it and create another thing because who will go and check onto the blockchain that this guy only has that particular uh, digital copy, right? So the mechanics of the overall NFT, it looked as a hype and it subsided uh, ultimately. But if we talk about the real world asset tokenization, economically, it makes a lot of sense. Why? because of the fact that a lot of investments that could be done they have a very big ticket value because the way that they are currently being made or managed it doesn't have an efficiency it doesn't have that particular transparency but if you create a record of a token which is a very low uh, like value token it's a 50 dollars or a hundred dollars so you get a lot more investors who could invest into a real world asset backed by gold backed by bonds backed by real estate over which they could get a kind of a dividend as well as they would get in certain cases like real estate uh, appreciation as well so and we if we see from a perspective of the audience uh, that the current uh, uh, like generation which is for the millennials or for the gen z's uh, the world has become a kind of a digital nomad uh, like in our times or our uh, parents time it was like that we used to work in one place and get around trying to build our own home over there and spend the lifetime income on building that particular home now the newer generation what they want to do they want to roam around the globe they are not having any fixed kind of a uh, a property that they want to actually invest in because it's a big larger size chunk that they have to invest in if a platform for real estate tokenizations are available where they, they buy they can invest partly their income in a property in london another uh, investment done in new york new york another investment done in dubai so they can actually uh, uh, like diversify their risk as well as without owning they will own and there is an advantage of instant liquidity as well that i want to sell it i cannot sell a one million dollar uh, home but i could easily sell like hundred thousand worth of token uh, because there would always be buyers available so the mechanics for the rwa are such that it's just a matter of time that the regulation catches up the technology catches up uh, uh, the appropriate awareness uh, is going to happen but this, I think, would be a way of the future investments that are going to happen. So and another thing, for example, if we take uh, technology like Metaverse. So again, there was a kind of a hype that initially came uh, with the Metaverse. And because of the generative AI, some uh, how the Metaverse get, get, got into the back end. Now, Metaverse uh, tagged with the NFT that was bound to fail because NFT was uh, not a kind of a technology because of the economies. As per our understanding, it, it would have always failed. But Metaverse, from a perspective, uh, if you see across this Gen Z, 
So you would see the little children that are now there, even if they are in their teens, they are on Roblox or uh, appropriate metaverses uh, that Fortnite, for example, and they are just talking over there, socializing over there, and they are having a gamified experience. Now imagine this same audience 10 years or five years from now when they would be the actual payers of the, the bills or they will be buying the things because right now they are riding on their parents money but when they will earn and they will spend so they will seek experiences which are more 3d immersive and socializing rather than the current 2d version of the websites that we are very happy to actually interact with so that will become a kind of a necessity uh, for organization whether they are bank or government institution to provide immersive experiences, gamified experiences, socializable experiences where they can go across with their friends and do the things across. So what I think the time for metaverse has not come now because of the economics uh, around it, because those Gen Zs are still not uh, uh, that rich uh, segment of the society. But once they become uh, the active users, uh, things would actually change and the metaverse would one uh, one uh, once again be a reality however for the millennials kind of user uh, what is happening at things like vision pro uh, those kind of devices are providing true immersive behavior and as the size of the gears as uh, uh, those particular richness in experience in terms of the quality of the, the 3d environment that is being uh, provided on those particular gears those things are solved and we we have seen that once upon a time the tvs used to be very very like uh, uh, thick uh, uh, and now they are so thin so similarly the vr devices would improve over time as well so once the, that technology time will come again uh, that would uh, be having an uh, impact. So, like, I think metaverse time is not uh, yet come, but in two to three years, this would be again a predominant uh, technology uh, which would be there. And if you see from an experience perspective, see, uh, there are very uh, realistic use case. For example, if I want to shop a property, uh, for example, for buying it or renting it, I have to go across to that particular property to experience it. If I see on a website like in UAE, there is Biyot or Property Finder, I could only see the images. But imagine I could be more immersive, go and feel that particular space whereby my family members are along with me and uh, we can talk across within that same space and we could comment across on the, that same space. So that is going to uh, change the way things are going to happen. Imagine now in the same home, if I have all those particular walls and I can uh, invite an interior designer, they can design the things which I could virtually see and then approve something and whereby a connected provider like IKEA is available from where I can directly order. So the overall experience changes. So real benefits would come uh, in those kind of a metaverse ecosystem so i we we still see a potential in the metaverse that's why we are working across uh, in that particular space uh, so yeah maybe the time is not right but it's a matter of time <laughs> absolutely you're right that each technology does have its, its own time to shine and maybe now is not the right time for the metaverse to shine but they will surely have a time when organizations would uh, leverage the metaverse to provide maybe more experiential um, sort of packages, services or products like you uh, precisely mentioned. And uh, when we talk about any emerging trends or technologies, of course, uh, Gen AI in the last couple of years has taken uh, people aback at large. And usually when a technology comes up, we initially it's in the hype phase, like you rightly mentioned, according to, to the Gartner report. And then uh, the hype sort of dies down and uh, either it sales well and it does have a lot of adopters or else it is forgotten. Like uh, and Matlab, it does. Uh, I mean, it still exists, but um, there there's not a lot that you can do with it. it it's like it's free in time like nfts are they're still relevant but uh, uh the optimism around nfts uh, wouldn't be as much as it was earlier 
so um, other than these technologies, what other technology or um, sort of trend do you see that will pick up in the coming years? And uh, some trend that as a technician yourself, as, as someone from the tech space, uh, you're anticipating to sail well in the future, blockchain related maybe. Okay, so what we see across is that see, uh, there is a technology stack that we are currently used to what comes as part of a technology stack at the very bottom is the infrastructure and infrastructure has two elements to it that how the compute happens which is the processing and how the networks happen so now what is happening is that this particular layer is being changed over time that you had cpus before but now there is gpus for graphic or AI processing, which is a fundamental part. And we could see companies like NVIDIA actually uh, gaining a lot based on that. And also there is an upcoming uh, compute unit, which is called a QPU, a quantum processing unit based on the quantum computing. So a class of problems uh, that would be like quite much solved efficiently based on that particular QPUs. So, existing ecosystem of CPUs, so you have more kind of compute uh, devices that is going to make the things faster. Similarly, in the networks, there is like 5G, 6G, those kind of networks are coming across, but the technology like IoT, again, with the more proliferation of uh, AI generated AI or AI-based bots that would be available because there would be machines. So machines would be talking uh, across with each others as well and along with the humans so those iot as a technology at a very lower infrastructure st stack would become very very much visible like uh, and sometimes everything would have a iot angle to it everything would have a gp gpu angle to it and a qpu angle to it uh, it's not only the, uh, in the data centers you will find the cpus so this is the first layer uh, which is there the second layer is the data layer whereby you store your data uh, data within a database. It could be a relational database or a NoSQL database, but its purpose is to store those particular records. Now, again, this is going to change because uh, uh, if we see uh, the other technologies that are uh, around, like the generative AI, whereby the content that is being created, it could be counter uh, like uh, counterfeited very easily you would not know the source of those particular records. So that's why technology like DLT would become very, very much promising because it's a tamper-proof record that would be kept. So what uh, we see across is that going forward, maybe traditional databases will go away and record records would be kept into those particular DLT uh, kind of a technology as a distributed ledger with more trust and more tamper-proofing and shareable across for cross-organization workflows with other uh, organizations and having the transparency angle associated with it. Now, the third part of this particular uh, stack of technology is the processing part, where there is certain code running which actually processes the information or does that particular communication or uses that particular infrastructure. We currently write programs that runs in this particular space. But going forward, what is going to happen that smart contracts would change a part of that particular processing logic because it would utilize the data which is in the DLT. Uh, so blockchain enabled smart contracts would be running or there would be generative AI based auto computing code that would be generated very, very easily. So li like this kind of code right now, what happens if there is an enhancement in a system that needs to be done? You ask your vendor, they will make the changes, then you will apply the release. But this generative AI piece of code would actually see all the regulations. It will take instructions in just human language and it would update that internal code and provide that particular functionality. Maybe a new regulation has come, it is already incorporated into the code. So such auto kind of code mechanism uh, would be available, which is AI enabled. Uh, so that's the where the overall uh, uh, this computing space uh, where, uh, where, where the programs would be uh, changed. The last layer is the visualization layer or the user interface layer. What we see right now, we have seen in our lifetimes the uh, mobile or smartphones, whereby our 
uh, uh, use of the finger has increased, right? Because we swipe the things across on that, but still we see the things in a 2D format on the mobile phone. Now, technologies like metaverse, technologies again like the generative AI uh, is going to help because I would be in a world which is more uh, immersive like the my physical world and I'll give commands using just my voice. I don't need to swipe or I know don't need to uh, do uh, like, for example, additional actions. Things could be done where the gestures like we could see in the VR gears that you could do the gestures. I can grab a thing and I can drop the thing, for example, or I could use my speech to actually get the things done. So it would be like a magical world. Uh, I could have a physical experience in a virtual world and uh, use the gestures based approach. So I think the overall way in which people interact with technology is going to change in a few years. Absolutely. And I'm sure that for um, technologists, a lot of it would be building that experience and how with changing times, technology, whether uh, technology yeah. is able to grasp all of that. Uh, but I'm sure that while implementing these technologies or while making people more familiar to uh, changing technologies, uh, it is going to still be a challenge for technologists who would be working in the back end. So what, according to you, would be some of the roadblocks that uh, as technologists or entrepreneurs, uh, people of the Web3 space or blockchain entrepreneurs might face in implementation? OK, so the challenges that come in a typical blockchain, enterprise blockchain implementation, for example, is more around the stakeholder management. Because in a typical uh, system that you deliver for one organization, you have to cater to their business teams, their IT teams, and their security teams. But if you are creating a consortium of 15 to 16 or 40 organizations, then you have to take across all the business teams from each of the organization. You have to take across all the IT teams from all the organization, the security teams from all the organizations. So a structure around governance is very, very much important because if the governance is not there, then people, things couldn't be controlled because in a kind of a uh, democratized system like this, where everybody is a stakeholder, you cannot enforce things. You have to take everyone together understand their problems and get the value out of the system so that stakeholder management becomes very very uh, important factor for a success of a enterprise blockchain project implementation that's one thing second thing is if we think from a research perspective there would be many technologies that would be there uh, you you need to understand upfront again as i specified the economics of having that technology because in real world if the cost of having a specific technology is more than the advantages uh, from based on the existing systems, uh, then this would not fly. Nobody would actually invest in the, those particular technologies. And it comes from multiple angles. From the day you deploy it, the cost of maintaining that particular technology. So even if you will uh, do a project in that particular manner, but if the cost of maintenance is more, it would be shelved ultimately because it would not be considered a success. So these factors have to be evaluated so that uh, a solution is provided or the organization in, invest in a technology which goes uh, a long way across and uh, uh, transforms their value chain as well. Absolutely. And even when we talk about implementation, I see that a lot of it revolves around the economics of implementation. And since yeah. you are sitting at, um, at a show called Money and Me, I think my final question to you would be uh, from your own journey where you've, you know, sort of started off, you started off as a developer, then on to a team lead and now as a CTO of Avanza. Um, how has your journey been in terms of learnings? And if there are any key advice to aspiring technologists or entrepreneurs around the conversation of money how you have uh, you know seen the importance of money in uh, not just enterprises but also in implementation of technologies or even in the success of a lot of organizations people and technologies okay so what it. i'll say is that since we've been working in the innovation space for some time uh, so what happens is that there are technologies available and it might also happen that the technology time has not come. But you need to believe. If you understand that the economics are going to work out, it would be an advantageous position 
in the future then newer business models newer uh, technology based business models you have to continue working on those particular things because i have seen from experience that there were time of my own disbelief but then i see across that five or six years or maybe 10 years across uh, those who invested in those areas they uh, got uh, a lot i'll tell you my personal story like around uh, in 2005 uh, what i did was that i me and my few friends thought across that ordering food over a uh, web for example is not available and it might be a very good thing so we started a business case based on that we developed application around it the portal was there everything was there but now we had to go and onboard the restaurants so we went to them and tell told them about that new model so uh, wherever we went they said nobody will come and book anything online so you just go away we tried for six months or something and then we thought okay this thing would not work and then one day you had somato and you have all these particular talabat and everybody who who was there right so it was too early maybe it was not that particular time but uh, the technology time will come if it has the right economics another use case that i see across is that like 15 years back i was saying across that we do all these payment from cards and everything why a qr code based pull payment mechanism is not there so we could do in this particular manner the payments i even met companies and tell told them this particular model they said no it doesn't happen via this particular mechanism payment gateway is integrated in this particular manner so nobody listened but then those uh, particular models have come across over here at one point in time i thought about why we go into all these particular malls and there are lines to actually buy these particular things why they just don't put some machines where we actually put our order and then go to the counter and pick those particular things up people said no why would you require that but then i could see at mcdonald's and other places as things coming up so it is only the thing that if you believe in the economics for all the innovators then there would be times people will not believe because they cannot see what you could see. So be uh, have the leap of faith and go forward and do it. But think across for two factors. The whatever you see, it's not a geeky idea. There has to be economic advantage uh, for its adoption. And secondly, there is a lot of hype about technology. So isolating what are the merits of the technology with respect to the hype. And what would be the challenges? And will uh, the other uh, uh, people around the globe will solve those particular challenges? That's the key to understand uh, and invest in that particular technology. Mm, absolutely. And I think uh, that uh, what we take away from our talk today um, on money and me has to be that belief is key to think if only you had believed in all of those ideas Ali that you had and it was rather funny to be listening to all of this and sometimes even I get ideas and I feel like this this must be a little too stupid to uh, execute but then a few years down the lane you actually see someone um, someone go ahead and innovate and produce that in the market for users so it's interesting um, to just uh, from your anecdotes, realize that uh, belief is the key. And uh, I'm sure that projects and businesses would sail if they had the right kind of mission and vision as well as belief. And it has been a rather delightful conversation today, Ali. Thank you so much once again for joining us at The Coin Republic.